All right, everyone, let's finish up this discussion as far as tuning hyperparameters with some discussion around cross-validation workflows and a little bit of philosophy right at the very end. I think that'll be kind of fun. Just to ensure that we're all on the same page, cross-validation is the general approach where we withhold a subset of the data during model training. We preserve it to use it in the testing phase where we can then test the trained model to determine the best hyperparameter settings in order to get the best model results in testing. This protects us from overfit and we have to make sure that the cross-validation is fair. But the general idea of cross-validation is that we have a training data set used for training, a testing data set withheld for testing. The jackknife approach is another approach, and it's a bit it's a bit old fashioned, good old jackknife. It combines training and testing into one step. In fact, we could see it as a specific case of k-fold cross validation, which we will talk about very quickly. You loop over all the data, you withhold that data value, just that one data value. You train on n minus one data through the entire workflow, and then you test on that withheld single data value. You calculate the model goodness metric and you're gonna aggregate that over all of the data. So you'll get a goodness of fit for every single data value and you go ahead and aggregate over all of that. Now, typically that can be seen as too easy of an estimation problem. You have N minus one training data available to you. Not very challenging perhaps to make that prediction at that one data location. K-fold is more of a general robust approach that would be used. K-fold cross-validation, how does it work? First step, select K. It's an integer, it's the number of folds to use. So we'll pick five, because I got lazy, I didn't wanna draw a lot, so we pick five. You loop over the K equals five subsets, Used So when we go to the first one, k is equal to 1, we've got this is our data going from 1 to n. And the order of the data could be important here, right? If they're random, then you're using random groupings. If they're ordered spatially, then you'll be taking subsets in space. So just be cognizant of that. It does matter how this is ordered. Then what you do is you take the five groups, you break up the data into five equal size bins. Group one, two, three, four, five. For the first k equals one, you will remove the first subset, train on this, this part of the data set. Now for k equals two, k fold two, we'll go ahead and withhold the second part, the second bin of the data, We'll train on the first, the third, the fourth, and the fifth, and we'll test on that. We'll get the metric, the goodness metric, as we discussed in the last, last lecture, and then we'll go ahead and repeat for third, fourth, and fifth, and we'll get a aggregation over the metrics, and that's what we'll report for the performance of the model for that specific set of hyperparameters. We can repeat that for the whole suite or ensemble of models with different hyperparameters, and from that, decide which hyperparameter combination is the best to work with. That's the k-fold cross-validation approach. Okay, so let's, let's stop and kind of take a look and think about some of the limitations of all the cross-validation methods we've been talking about. First of all, what are some of the issues? What can go wrong in cross-validation? First, peaking information leakage. The idea here is some information is transmitted from the withheld data into the model. Some modeling decisions were made using all of the data. And so when we do the test, we're kind of fooling ourselves. We cheated a little bit effectively. Now, you gotta be careful because if you think about it, if you step back, there were choices about even what type of model to use that probably came from some evaluation with all of the data. You, you see, so this is a little bit insidious as far as what's really fair or not. And really, we should not be peaking at all if we're testing the real world use of our model. Fair train and test split. 
Many practitioners are just using random selection for train test split. In fact, that's a methodology built right into scikit-learn. It's maybe too easy of a prediction problem in a spatial temporal context. So we got to be careful about that. We're going to use it a bunch. I'll admit it. We use it a bunch, but we should recognize that. Black swans and stationarity. The model cannot be tested for data events that are not available in the data. That whole idea of black swans is you spend your entire life studying white swans. You won't know anything about the possibility of black swans until you see one. Yeah, there's also the, this is also known as the no free lunch theorem in machine learning, which we could summarize using going back in the good old days, attributed to Hume that even the observation of the frequent or constant conjunction of objects we have no reason to draw any inference concerning any object beyond those of which we have had experience. Basically, exactly what we were saying about stationarity. What are other issues? Well, we could step back and ask the question, is it even possible to do validation in the case of the subsurface or natural systems in general or rescues? 1994 and all have an amazing paper, probably one of the most cited papers ever in, in science. And so they suggest that it's not possible to validate in open earth systems or open natural systems. Now, this is the entire abstract from the paper. I've taken it directly from the websites for science. And what they state is verification and validation of numerical models of natural systems is impossible. This is because natural systems are never closed and because model results are always non-unique. Models can be confirmed by demonstration of agreement between observation and prediction, but confirmation is inherently partial. Complete confirmation is logically precluded by fallacy of affirming the consequent and by incomplete access to the natural phenomenon. Models can only be evaluated in relative terms and the predictive value is always open to question. The primary value of models is heuristic. Wow, that's awesome. I just love that. I welcome you to read that paper. If you haven't read it, it will change your modeling life. That now, you know, this gets us thinking about other great thoughts and we can go to George Box and the idea of all models are wrong, but some are useful. And we can break that down with these two concepts here, such as the concept of parsimony, which since all models are wrong, maybe an economical description of the system, a very simple description of the system can still be beneficial and we can still learn from it. I like this one, worrying selectively. As a parent, this is a good thing to learn, I'll tell you. Since all models are wrong, figure out what is most importantly wrong. That, isn't that cool? I, I love that. The idea of what would cause the most trouble to be wrong? What would be the most impactful if wrong? Now, what do I say? I'd step back from all of this and what I would suggest is be humble. The earth is going to surprise you. <laughs> All right. I hope that this was a good discussion around tuning hyperparameters and building our models and checking our models. We covered training and testing, model goodness metrics, and cross-validation workflows. As always, I hope that these course lectures are useful to you, to my students, to those who have already graduated, to those who are working professionals. I salute you. Howdy. Uh, good day. And um, to anyone else tuning in, hey, science. Let's do it. Engineering and science is awesome. I'm um, available on Twitter. I'm the Geostats guy on GitHub. All of the workflows and everything I show is available and also on YouTube, all of my lectures. All right. Hey, take care.